Hi, this is Jeff Challen. Today, it's freezing outside. And so rather than meeting together in Lincoln Hall, we're going to go over the slides together online. I wanted to do this because we're at a point in the semester where we're really still learning things rapidly and I don't want us to get behind. And today's topic is incredibly important because we're gonna start talking about a new way of saving data in Java and a way that allows us to work with an incredibly useful kind of data that we find in the real world, a kind of data that's been created by humans for thousands of years, a kind of data that's part of your daily life as a human being. I'm talking about strings, text, words, language. The way that Java stores and allows us to work with this kind of data introduces us to a new idea in Java, the idea of something called an object. And Java objects allow us to model data in a very natural way. And it's something that we're gonna talk about a lot this semester a little bit later on. But because of how important and how interesting text data is, we want to introduce strings now so that we can start working with them, um, we can start using them, we can start doing some fun homework problems with them um, and get you comfortable analyzing, processing, and being able to uh, store and manipulate this type of data. Okay, so uh, to start, um, at this point in the semester, what we've talked about are ways to store data using a few different types of data and ways to store data primarily based on Java's primitive types. So Java has eight primitive types. They fall into three categories. We know how to store integer data. These are numbers of different sizes, depending on how large or small we want to, a number to store. We know how to store decimal numbers. So we know how to store numbers that include a decimal component. Uh, we refer to these as floating point numbers. We have a couple of types for that. Uh, we've talked about care, which stores a single character, um, not a, uh, an array of characters. So there's a limitation here that we're gonna remove today. Um, and truth values. So whether or not something is true or false, there is a special type for that. So these are our eight Java primitive types. And as you remember about these primitive types, they are all have one thing in common, which is that they store one value. So they allow us to store a single value and they can be represented numerically. So the integers, and the floating point numbers are obviously numbers. When we talk about characters, when we looked at the ASCII character code table, we looked at how to map a number to a character, and that's done by convention. And then when we talk about Boolean values, true or false, we just use 0 or 1 internally to represent those values. So all of the Java primitive types allow us to store one value, and they can store that value numerically. So that's what sort of uh, uh, binds them together. As you might notice, there's a lots of different types of data in the world that we can't store just using these primitive types. And one of the most important types of data, most interesting types of data for human beings, um, is this type of data. So this is a book by David Foster Wallace, who has some associations uh, with this area. This is widely considered you know, a modern masterpiece. Um, and it's a series of characters, but we can't store that in Java yet. Um, more familiar to you might be things like this. So conversations that you've had, um, communications you have with friends or other people online. Um, humans use character sequence of character strings in a lot of other places. So on license plates, for example, license plates could be numeric, but they're typically alphanumeric. So they're a series of, of numbers and characters, and that's because humans are good with this type of thing. We've developed this ability to um, process written language. And so it gets used all over the place, even for identifiers on places like license plates. Passwords. So again, secrets that humans exchange, we typically refer and, and save them in our brains as strings, as a piece of language, as a series of characters. In computer science, we call these strings. So you call text a sequence of characters a string. I can't remember when I actually learned this. And when I was originally writing these slides, I was thinking, I don't know. I don't, I've always been referring to these as strings. Maybe that's not normal, but it is normal now for you. This is how we talk about text. So you refer to a piece of text as a string. And a lot of the data in our world, in our human world, that's interesting is in this form. 
and that's because humans have, you know, one of the, the you know, most impressive inventions of, of humans, and one of the things that distinguishes us from other species is written language. Spoken language, you know, whales communicate with each other using various types of vocalizations and things like that. Uh, birds sing songs, but humans uh, are the only species that we know of that uses this written language to save our communications, to be able to allow them to travel over long distances, etc. And so not only uh, the new data that we're creating in the world is stored in this form, but we actually have a lot of existing data that computers are starting to be able to process that's also stored in text form. So there's a, an, an emerging area that's sometimes referred to as the digital humanities, where um, you know humanities disciplines are starting to use the tools of computer science to do things like you know analyze word usage in, in text that we have started to enter into computers and be able to process using computer algorithms. So um, you know humans create a lot of interesting text data. You think about all the tweets that people put up on Twitter. Um, a lot of the things that we do on Facebook. Photos are another you know interesting form of human data, but a lot of it is still text. Um, and so starting today, we're going to be able to represent that data in our computer programs, process it, and sort of do fun things with it. So Java has a type for storing this type of information. Um, that type is called a string. You might notice something different about the name of this type compared with the types that we've already seen, and that's going to make sense in a few minutes. Initially, the string type works pretty similar to how you've seen other types work. So here's a little snippet of code. On line one, I'm declaring a string variable called maybe. Um, on line two, I'm setting that string variable to a string literal, which is on the right side of the assignment. So I'm assigning maybe to challenge, uh, which I don't like to be called. Um, on line three, I'm reassigning maybe to a string literal Jeff, which is what I prefer to be called. Um, and then I'm calling a function called call me, and I'm passing it that variable maybe. And so again, on first glance, this type works quite similar to the other types that we've already talked about in Java, the primitive types. I'm declaring a variable. I can assign it as part of the declaration as well. I can use literal values in my code. Here I see a literal challenge um, right here on this line, and then a literal Jeff on this line. I can pass that as an argument to functions, which we started talking about on Monday. So in many ways, this behaves a lot like the primitive types. But strings are not primitive types. And so here's an example designed to, to, to sort of show you something about them that you can't do with the primitive type. So uh, on line one, I'm creating a string variable called password, and I'm initializing it to this um, variable choo choo dog. That's a string literal in my code. Now I've got my familiar system dot 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 println, but I have this unfamiliar um, uh, construct here where I have the name of the variable. I have this dot notation, which we've seen in one place before, but not quite in this way. And then I have this uh, length um, that follows it and uh, an open and closed parentheses. And down here, I have something similar where I'm taking the name of the variable. I have a dot. This is referred to as dot notation. And then I have um, this thing. And, and one thing to, to, to notice is that this looks a lot like a function call, doesn't it? This sort of looks like... Um, a function call to a function named equals, and I'm passing it an argument. This looks like a function call to a function named length, that I'm passing uh, no arguments. Uh, so this might be familiar to us based on what we see on Monday. What's unfamiliar is this idea of calling a function by using a variable and then this dot notation. So this turns out that this works. So it's interesting. So when we run this code, I see that password.length with these open and close uh, parentheses prints nine. And that is, in fact, the length of that string. It's the number of characters in the string. So that's interesting. Um, then on line three, I'll, I'm, again, I'm calling this other function. And we're going to look at the documentation for strings in a minute. But you might be able to sort of just guess at what this does. Um, I'm saying, you know, does the variable password equal this string literal zizcat? Um, and in this case, it's printing false. So it looks like I've called a function named equals. I've passed it an argument named zizcat, and I'm printing the result, which in this case is false. If I change this to choo-choo dog, then you're going to see that it's going to print true. If I change the 
um, literal here to choo choo, then you're going to see that the length I should expect is six, and then this is now false again because choo choo is not equal to choo choo dog. So this is something I can't do with uh, with a, a typical uh, Java primitive type. I should say with any Java primitive type. So I've never been able to use this dot notation with the primitive type. So for example, uh, let's let's just say I do int another variable and I equal that. I, I initialize that to four um, and I try to do. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm using the syntax I see here for the strings. Let's see if it's equal to four. That, that doesn't work. Um, so it's going to say a method equals is not declared um, on line three. Uh, so this doesn't work for primitive types, but, but it does work for strings. So this is going to be, um, this is new. This is something that, that we're going to talk about. Now. The reason why this works and the reason why strings are exciting from the, uh, from the perspective of introducing you to new ideas in programming is because strings are our first example of what's referred to in Java as an object. So objects are something we're going to talk about a lot more in this class. Um, we have a whole kind of unit, kind of the whole second third of the class is about object-oriented programming. We're going to introduce you to a lot of interesting ideas um, at that point. But we're talking about, we want to talk about strings and strings are objects, and so there's a little bit of this that you're going to see now. Um, objects combine state and behavior. So objects bring together two things that we've already seen in our programs. They allow us to store data like variables, and they also allow us to uh, associate behaviors, algorithms, or functions with a particular variable. So objects bring together these, these two features, state, that's sort of data, and behavior, functions that implement algorithms. So objects can, um, an object variable can not only store information, but it can also do things. So if you go back and look at our example here, um, this password variable is storing this data internally. Um, I can print it, um, so if I just print password, you're going to see it prints choo-choo, so it knows what I've sent it to, but it also allows me to do things based on that information. So for example, I can compare its value to a, another string or to a string literal. And so state, the actual array of characters that it was initialized to, and behavior, the ability in this case to provide a function called equals that implements an algorithm comparing whatever's passed to it to, to the internal state of that variable. Um, so again, each string has a state. That state is the array of characters that the string was initialized to. And then the string also has behavior. It has a bunch of functions that are defined on the string type or the string class that we'll look at in a minute. Um, these functions utilize its internal state to do interesting things. And strings actually have a whole bunch of different useful methods that you're going to get practice with using on the homework and that we'll use in a few minutes to solve a couple of problems that have to do with how we process strings. So when we think about objects, we're always going to uh, concern ourselves with these two questions. The first one is, what does it store? The second one is, what can it do or what does it do? In the case of strings, strings store an array of characters and strings provide a wide variety of interesting functions or methods that I can call that do allow me to do things like compare them with other strings, return their length, um, break them into pieces depending on uh, where certain characters are and things like that. And again, we'll, we'll get some practice with this in a minute. So when we start to think about objects versus primitives, this is a really important distinction for us to understand. Um, in, a, in Java, primitive types store something that can be represented as a single number. And all eight Java primitive types, one way to help you keep them separate is that their names always start with the lowercase letter. So int, care, long, everything we've seen so far, those types start with the lowercase letter. And they store something that can be represented as a single number. Objects, in contrast, can represent much more complicated pieces of information. And they allow us to model data in a much more natural way. So for example, if you started working on MP0, and I hope you have started working on MP0, you may have seen that MP0 forces you to work with location data in this really unnatural way. So these 
functions that you're writing take like one array of latitudes, one array of longitudes, and the data in them is linked up by the index. But you might have thought like that's kind of stupid. I mean, this this is a really unnatural way of working with this information. Shouldn't there be a way to just have one variable that stores both the latitude and the longitude? And the answer is there is. That variable would be an object in Java, and the reason we don't use them on MP0 is we haven't talked about that yet. But on later MPs, you're going to see how to use objects, and you're going to see that they would allow you to solve that problem in a much, much more elegant and natural way. Objects in Java can be made up of multiple other objects or primitive types. So for example, a location object that I might come up with might have a double to store the decimal longitude and a double to store the decimal latitude. So it's made up of two, in that case, primitive types. Object names in Java follow a convention where they start with an uppercase letter. So string, as you noticed, is capitalized. And that's because strings are Java objects. Most of what we work with throughout the rest of the semester, um, you know, when we start talking about new types or new classes, are going to be objects. Because you can't create new primitive types. Java comes with eight, and those are the ones you're stuck with. So the way that you model or work with different kinds of data in Java is frequently by creating objects, uh, a new type that allows you to model a particular kind of data. And again, this is something we'll get a lot more practice with um, starting in a few weeks. So uh, for now, we're gonna use strings as sort of a gentle introduction for using objects. So we're not gonna have you design objects yet. You'll get some practice doing that later. But strings not only allow us to work with this really exciting type of data, but they also provide kind of a gentle introduction to how to use objects as a Java program. So normally, to initialize an object in Java, we use this special piece of syntax that's called the new keyword. So these are both valid ways to declare and initialize a variable in Java. So on the left side of this expression, I'm declaring a variable called myString um, that's of type string. Um, sorry, I'm going to try to... So variable name is myString, the type is string. I have my assignment operator, and on the right, I'm initializing it. And here I see this new keyword, the type that I'm using to initialize the variable, in this, this case is string, and then something that looks like a, a function call, again. And in this case, it, it receives a single argument, which is the literal that I want to initialize the string to contain. So when I'm done with line one, I'm going to have a variable called my string that internally is going to store this array of characters, A, B, C, in that order. Again, with text, the order is incredibly important. So I'm not only storing the values, A, B, and C as characters, but I also store them in a particular order that's meaningful. On line two, a similar um, declaration and initialization, I'm declaring a variable called another string of type string, and I'm initializing it to def. And I'm doing that by using the new keyword, the type, and I'm passing uh, this as the argument to this, um, to this type. Now, you're not going to see this very often in our code. This will make more sense when we talk about objects, and we're going to get there. So don't freak out. Um, this uh, syntax may be a little bit um, unfamiliar, and we're, we're not going to explain it very well. The reason we're not going to explain it very well is because strings in Java are such a common data type that Java provides a shorthand for initializing them. So you can initialize a string in a way that looks a lot like a primitive type. So we're not going to use this syntax up here. Instead, what we're going to use is this syntax down here. And this looks a lot more like what we're used to. I have a type, string, a variable name, my string, the assignment operator, uh, my equal sign, and then over on the right, a string literal. So just like primitive types, strings can have literals. String literals consist of a double quote followed by whatever uh, letters I want in the string in order uh, and close with the double quote. This is something that can trip you up. So in Java, a character literal that stores one character uses single quotes. A string literal that stores a sequence of characters uses double quotes. On line two, I'm, you know, so again, this is uh, equivalent to the code above. On line two, I have a variable called other string of type string, and I'm assigning that to the string literal def. Okay. Now, there are, I just want to, in the interest of full disclosure, I just want to point out that there are minor differences between these two code snippets, but, but they're not worth worrying about. 
these are not quite exactly the same thing if you if you look at the internals of how Java works, uh, but this is really inside baseball at this point, so we're just not going to worry about it. So, like, so Java is, so strings are so important, this is sort of interesting, right, um, that there, there are two, if I remember correctly, objects in Java that support literals. Most objects in Java don't support literals. So when we looked at primitive types, you know, remember that three here is a numeric literal that I'm using to initialize this variable first of type int. And I also have Boolean literals that I can use to initialize Boolean variables. Um, this is a character literal. All the Java primitive types allow me to initialize them using literals. Strings are one of the only objects in Java that can be initialized using a literal. Uh, there's one other kind, but it, it's not worth uh, mentioning because it's it's not something we're going to use this semester. So in this case, again, I see an assignment that looks very similar to the assignments that I'm used to seeing with primitive types. So I have a string, I have a, a new variable here called test of type string, and its value is set to test space me. So test space me is a string literal here that I'm using to initialize the string variable test. Now, one thing I want to point out, so you have seen the new keyword before, and I, I just want to make a connection with something that we've uh, done in the past. We saw it when we initialized arrays. So remember, this was how I initialize an array of size 8. I have uh, my array type, which in this case I'm creating a single dimensional array of type int, the name of my variable, which is array, the assignment operator, um, which apparently is hard to select, and the new keyword followed by the type of the array and in brackets the size that I want in this case. So I'm creating a, an array, a single dimensional array of integers called array that is initially of size 8. Uh, size of eight. So Java arrays are also objects. That's why we create them with the new keyword. And you remember that in our loops we've been using this property of arrays, array.length. And when we introduced that, we were like, just don't worry about it very much. It doesn't make sense right now. The new keyword as well. This is one of the things that's frustrating about Java sometimes as an intro language is it has these little bits of confusion sort of built into it. But now hopefully this makes a little bit more sense. So arrays in Java are also objects. That's why I have to use new when I create them. And that's also why they have this property, um, dot length. Okay. One thing you're going to see commonly uh, with strings, and this is another thing that's a little bit special about them, is that strings are also one of the only types in Java, the only non-numeric type where I can use the, um, uh, the plus operator. And in strings, the plus operator is not, uh, you might wonder, like, what does it mean to add two strings together? It means to concatenate them, to combine them left to right. So in this case, <coughs> excuse me, um, I'm initializing on line one, a string variable called first, I'm setting that to my first name. I'm initializing on line two, a string variable called last, and I'm setting that to last name. And then I'm gonna set a string variable called full, and I'm gonna set that equal to my first name, concatenated with a space, concatenated with my last name. And so that will, when it's done, full will equal Jeffrey space chow. All right. So let, let's you know play around with this a little bit. Uh, we've we've introduced a few new things. Um, so now I have uh, two different ways to. I'm showing you both ways to create and initialize strings, and they both you know again they both work. Um, so I can print my string and that's ABC. Another string is going to be equal to def, and that combined string is going to be equal to the two uh, combined together. And I can also use literals as part of my concatenation operator. So here's a way to put um, a space in there, or I can put a dash in there, or whatever. Um, so, so again, just to make sure that you don't confuse yourself, this will not work, right? Um, so it's going to complain right here uh, on line two. It says closing single quote missing. Uh, but what's really happening here is that um, I'm trying to use a single quote, which is only something I can only use to declare character literals to uh, declare a string. You might wonder, like, what do I do if I want to put a quote, a literal quote character inside my string? Um, there's a special way to do this by using what's called an escape or a backslash. So in this case, you'll see that now my string itself contains a quote character. Normally, the quotes are not uh, part of the string literal. 
they just indicate where it starts and where it stops. But if I want to put one inside, I can do that using this, this backslash syntax. Okay, good. So strings give us a chance, our first chance in Java, well, kind of, because we, we did this sort of with arrays, um, but it's our first chance to really kind of get an experience of using what's called dot notation in Java. Dot notation is the way that you access an object's state and methods. So it gives you a way to modify the state of the object if that's uh, possible. With strings, that's not possible. So once you initialize a string in Java, there's no way to change its value. If you want to uh, create a new string like we did over here, uh, you do that by combining uh, two existing strings in some way. So, but strings do have a bunch of interesting methods. So there's a bunch of different um, uh, functions that a string provides that we can call on instances of strings to do interesting things. So we've already seen the length um, method. This takes, oops, sorry. The length method takes no arguments and returns the length of the string. On line four, you'll see another uh, string method that also takes no arguments. And you might guess what this does um, from, from its name. Again, you know, when you choose good names for your methods, you can frequently infer what those methods do without having to look them up. But I will show you where to look them up in a minute. And then this function, so this is interesting. So this is an example of a string method that takes two arguments. So the first argument uh, is a character. The second argument is a character. And again, you know, you might uh, challenge yourself to kind of guess what this does. So this says replace, and then it takes one character and another character. So you might uh, ask yourself, what do I think that's going to do? We'll play with this in a minute, but these are examples of how to utilize these various um, methods and interesting functions that the string class provides. So you might wonder, where do I find out about this stuff? Like, how do I figure out how, how to do this? Strings, along with you know every other useful type in Java, provide uh, really extensive documentation. So this is uh, what's referred to as Java doc. Um, and you know, if, if you read through this, you'll get a lot of interesting information about sort of how strings work and how, how uh, they represent the information inside of them. Um, but the most important, uh, you know, or maybe one of the most important bits is, is this list down here. So this is a list of all the methods that the string, um, that individual strings will allow you to use. So these are various functions that you can call once you have a string variable. So for example, and, and a lot of these are, are things you're never gonna use. Um, but I can, but some of them are useful. So for example, I can look for a string inside another string. Um, I can compare one string with another. So I can decide if two strings are the same. Um, I can get the, so this is actually a, um, a pretty useful one. I can look for a, a character inside a string and you'll see this gives me the first occurrence of the specified character. Um, I can, uh, I have something that tells me if the string is empty um, and so I have a length, right? So that's something that we've been using. Um, let's see down here, there's a couple of the ones. Yeah, so to lowercase, convert all the characters to lowercase. Uh, to uppercase, convert all the characters to uppercase. Um, you know, I can take a string and remove uh, white space, which are blank, uh, blank values from its beginning and its end, etc. So, So strings, you know, just having a string variable now gives me the ability to use all of these cool methods to do fun stuff with it. Um, so, and, and you don't have to implement these, somebody did all this for you. So once you have a string in Java, that string carries along with it all of these capabilities. And we're gonna use a couple of those uh, along with our, um, now, you know, some, give us practice later in this, um, later in this lecture to do some work uh, processing strings. So we're gonna write some functions that use these, um, these methods to do some new things. All right, so, but let's just sort of get some practice with this. So here on line one, I'm creating a string variable called example and I'm initializing it to the string test. So the series of characters, T, E, S, T in that order. Um, the string, as I mentioned before, doesn't contain the opening double quotes or the closing double quotes. Those are just to delineate uh, where the string starts and ends. Then I'm going to call this method called length. And this is a um, you know, useful method, particularly when we're looping over strings, which we'll, which we'll look at in a little bit. So I think this is gonna print four. Um, then I'm calling this method called replace. And again, I was speculating a little bit about this and you might 
I, I'm not going to tell you, but you might just sort of, you know, quietly think, what, what, what might this do? We're going to see what it does in a minute. And then I'm calling uh, the, I'm printing the result of calling to uppercase on, on the string value. So it printed four as I expected. Here, um, what replace seems to have done is it seems to have replaced all of the instances of T in the string with this character B. That's kind of interesting. And then finally, um, you'll see that when I call to uppercase, I get the string in all uppercase letters. Now, one thing to note is that replace did not modify the string. So as I said before, once you initialize the string in Java, you can't modify its contents. What example.replace did is it returned a new string with the modified contents. And the way that you can convince yourself of that is when I call example.to uppercase, I don't see the T's replaced with B's. I see the original T's that were part of my original string. Right? And actually, if I put a, another println down here and print off my string value, you'll see that it's unmodified. So even these calls to to uppercase and replace don't modify the original string. Okay, so, so let's have some fun with this. I can replace this with a C, and now I see something a little bit different. Um, let's try starting with a uppercase value and running to lowercase. Um, that'll also work. One, it, just one interesting side note, um, you know, some of these methods, again, are, are, are a little bit connected with certain um, alphabets. So in, in the Latin alphabet, case is something that makes sense. Um, and that it shares that feature with, with several other alphabets, but there's certainly alphabets out there in the world where the idea of a lowercase or uppercase value is meaningless. Um, and so you'll see there's a note there on the description of two uppercase that it does this conversion using the rules of the current locale, right? So, so essentially what this says is, hey, I can see that this is you know, an, an, an English string or I have some information about the alphabet this is in and I'm using that to do the translation. If I initialize this with a bunch of characters from a language that doesn't support case, then I suspect that this would not make any changes. Okay, so, um, so I'm, I'm just gonna leave this up here uh, for you guys to, to mess around a little bit. Um, I would encourage you to you know, go back and explore some of, these, um, so some of these functions and see if you can get them to do some interesting things. Uh, one challenge I would say is there, there's a, a function that returns, so when I go through a string and I want to, um, there, there's times when I go through a string and I want to look at every character one at a time. And so I would encourage you to uh, figure out how to do that. I can't index a string the same way I index an array. So uh, if I have a string, so for example, I can't do this. Um, internally, the string does um, store an array of characters, but this is, uh, so strings are not uh, an array type. So it's a subscript not allowed on non-array type. Um, so strings are not arrays, and so this is meaningless, but there is a way to retrieve the character from the string that is at index zero. And I'll, I'll let you figure out how to do that. Okay, so obviously you can't ask me questions live, but uh, please um, you know, post on the forum if you have questions about strings. Um, so we have about you know, 10, 15 minutes left, and I think what we're going to do at this point um, is talk about some ways, or we'll solve some problems together. Um, so this is going to give us practice with algorithms. It's going to give us practice with uh, utilizing strings. And it's also going to give us practice with writing functions. So we're going to write a function here um, that's going to, and this is a nice way to kind of um, connect something we did last time with something we did this time. So last time we wrote this function using an array of characters. But that's weird because normally we don't use array of characters in Java, we use strings because usually the data that we want to represent an array of characters is represented more naturally using a string variable. So let's rewrite our existing algorithm for finding uh, consecutive uh, characters in an array and let's write it to process a string instead. So. The, the algorithm we're going to use is pretty much the same as last time. We're going to look at every character in the string, and we need to find out a way to do that. So that's going to force us to go back to the documentation. And we're, then we're going to compare it with the next value, or the previous value, depending on how you want to write it. Um, I also have to figure out how to loop through every element in the string in a way that's similar to what I, I did with, with uh, a character. 
And I'm sticking this here because I would encourage you to, to refer to the Java doc documentation as you complete this problem. Um, so, so here's how we're gonna do these next couple of examples. I'm going to arrive here at this, um, this example, and I'm gonna encourage you right now to pause the video and work on this problem. Give yourself, you know, two, three, four minutes, give it a try, utilize this documentation right here. Um, so, you know, tr try to figure out how to do this. Um, I'm going to let you pause for a minute. In a minute, I'm just gonna stop talking for 10 seconds, and then we'll meet up again and we'll go through the problem. Okay, so hopefully you've worked on that for a few minutes. Now let's solve it together. So the first thing I need to be able to do is figure out how to write a loop um, over my string. So how do I do that? Well, I'm, okay, so, so before, I'm just gonna kind of write my canonical loop for arrays, um, and I, I, I might try compiling that, and, and I'm gonna get this error um, because Unlike an array, and this is something in Java that is confusing and, and is gonna trip you up a few times, strings don't have a length property. Instead, what they have, if I go back to the documentation, um, is they have a length method. So for a string, I can get its length in a similar way, but it's a function. So I have to call that function. The way I'm gonna call that function is by adding these parentheses here. So now this is going to work and to be sure, let's print off the index inside the loop. And so you can see um, I start at zero, I'm going all the way up through 10. Let's make sure that's correct. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, 11. So there are 11 characters in Mississippi. That means that the first character is at index zero, the last character is at index 10. So that's good. So I've got my loop here how do I get at the value inside the string? So again, I can't do this. This will not work. It's gonna give me a error because strings are not an array type. So I've gotta find a way to do this. So let's look, sort of look through the documentation here. Um, I, I might look for something that starts with get, uh, but, I, but that doesn't seem to, to, there doesn't seem to be a function called get that's gonna help me here. Um, so I'm just going to keep browsing through the documentation, um, and well, maybe I'll start at the top. Okay, and and you know when you start reading stuff like this, I know it's intimidating. I know that there's a lot of stuff in here, um, but in this case, huh? Wow. Okay, so I got lucky. The top thing on this alphabetical documentation is this function called care at. And let's read the document. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a way to read Java documentation, so let's read this together. This reads like a function declaration, the, the, the left part of this. This says there's a method called care at. It takes an integer argument. It returns a character. And the description says returns the care value at the specified index. Huh. Okay. Well, the best way to figure out if this works is just to try it. So let's take our string variable call care at i. There we go. So we got it. So this is actually one of the more useful string methods, maybe, um, you know, depending on your perspective. It allows me to retrieve a single character from the string. Okay, great. So I'm, I'm on the right track. So now essentially I know how to do the things that I need to do with the string in order to replicate my earlier solution. So I know how to loop through the string and I know how to retrieve a character from the string in a particular index. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use these two uh, capabilities together. And let's say that I'm going to look at the next character. So if I'm at index i, then the next character is at index i plus 1. I'm comparing these two together. And if they are equal, I'm going to print off the input at that index. Okay, so what did I add here? I've got a conditional statement. I'm comparing the character at index i, and I'm getting that by calling care at, and I'm passing it this index, my current index. I'm comparing it with the input at uh, the next character. So the input at 
uh, character, the character in the input at index i plus one. If they're equal, I'm going to print them. Okay, so I'm, I'm doing good here. Uh oh, I've got this. Uh oh, I've got this problem. Uh, programming is so frustrating. So, um, string index. What is this telling me? I'm going to look at the error message carefully. It says I've got a string index out of bounds exception, and it says string index out of range eleven. So what it seems here is that I, I've I, I'm using a bad index for the string. And if I remember back to a few days ago, there was this like small change I had to make to this loop to get this to work. And in fact, the problem is that the last time I go through this loop, I'm actually trying to retrieve uh, the, um, the index 11 of the string. And the string doesn't have a character at index 11. The first valid index is zero. The last valid index is 10 because the string has length 11. And so I'm looking, I'm asking the string, I'm saying, hey, give me your character at line at index 11. And it says I don't have that. So it, it's producing an error. So the way to fix this is to modify my loop slightly so that it doesn't walk off the end of the string. And again, going back to last time, we sort of realized that um, a string that has length n or a character array that has length n only has n minus one pairs of characters. So again, um, mi is one pair, is is one pair, ss is one pair, si is one pair, etc. Et Mississippi has 10 pairs of characters. This loop will execute 10 times. It'll start at zero. The last index I look at will be i minus two and i minus one. And so that, when I take i minus one, that'll give me the right index. Okay, so let's try this. There we go. Okay, so now I have something that works. And let's see if it's correct. So. Um, there's one, let's change this. We're gonna misspell Mississippi. Okay, so now I see that I don't see that first S printed. Um, I could also use string concatenation here to uh, make this output a bit prettier. This is now going to print both the character that's repeated and the index. So you'll see that the first character that's repeated um, is here at index two, and that's because index two is equal to index three. The next character that's repeated is an index five. Let me put another space in here so it's a little prettier. Um, five is this S, and it's equal to the character in the next index. Okay, so this works. The last thing let's do is let's package this inside a function. Um, sorry, so I'm gonna, this is gonna be a function that doesn't return a value. I'm gonna console, call it consecutive characters. Um, I'm going to have it take a string called input. Um, I'm going to rename this to test value just to, to make sure that the code isn't super confusing. Um, so now I've got this little snippet of logic that I've worked out. Now I'm going to package it up in a function. And remember that the static uh, keyword is something I have to add when we're doing these little examples together, but it's not normally uh, something you need to worry about. Now when I run it, I don't see any input. The reason is I'm not calling my function. So now I'm going to call consecutive characters. I'm going to pass it test value. Um, and you'll see the correct result. Um, because I've packaged it up as a, a function, I can call it with literals. Um, you know, I, I can do whatever I want here. Okay, great. So our first, you know, more practice working with algorithms, more practice writing functions, and an introduction to, to how to use strings. Awesome. Okay, so let's do a, a, another example here. Um, this one is, you know, uh, I, I think maybe a little bit more fun, uh, maybe not, but uh, this gives you um, the chance to do some a little bit more complicated string processing. Um, and this is, you know, I, I hate to break it to you, but this is like sort of not an uncommon thing to have to do as a computer scientist is to take, so there's a lot of data in the world that's in string form. And there's times when we have to work with it in ways to kind of take it from one format and reformat it and change it into some other format. So imagine that, you know, you're working at some company and they've got this whole database of information and they've got all these phone numbers formatted in this, this format over here on the left. Uh, because at some point, you know, the, the previous uh, CTO of the company, you know, felt like this was the best way to format uh, phone numbers is with dots because he liked how it looked. And actually, I actually went through that phase myself a few years ago. Um, and, and I graduated from it uh, to the point where now I feel like this is the nice way to format uh, phone numbers. And obviously, you know, great minds probably don't think alike on this. Um, 
But now, you know, that CTO got fired and there's somebody new and they've decided, well, I want all the strings on our data, the, the phone numbers in our database to look like this. And so your job is to get this to work. Um, so how do we do this? Okay. So it's going to require us to think a little bit more uh, about how to, how to approach this problem. And a lot of times when we're working with this type of string data, what we want to do is we want to look for structure, look for um, you know, things about the string um, and, and the formats that, that, that is in already, the format our data is in already, that will allow us to identify uh, the different parts. So for example, you can see here that the phone number has three parts. The first part is 111, the second part is 222, the third part is 333. And each one of those parts has been um, sort of copied over from one place in the old format to a new place in the new format. That data is the same in both the old format and the new format. What's changed is the stuff around it. So rather than having you know, the area code and the first um, part of the phone number and the second part of the phone number separated by periods, now I want to enclose the area code in uh, parentheses. I want to have the first part of the phone number um, separated from the second part of the phone number by a dash, and I have this space in here as well. But what I really want to be able to do is identify the first, second, and third parts of this phone number. And to do that, the key thing to see is that I've got this period here. This is sometimes referred to as a separator. So this is going to allow me to break this string into three parts. And I'll be able to isolate the 111 from the 222, the area code, from the first three digits of the phone number, from the last four digits of the phone number. Once I can do that, I can reformat it any way I want. I can convert it into a bunch of different formats, but it'll be fairly straightforward to convert it into the format that I want. Okay, so the first thing I'm gonna do is figure out how to isolate each part of the phone number. How do I isolate the first part from the second part from the third part? Once I've done that, then I just have to combine the values appropriately to create the new string. So that's actually pretty, that's gonna be the easier part. Okay, so again, I'm going to point you back to the documentation here um, to give you some a, a starting point um, to look into this because you might want to kind of, you know, a, a lot of times the right way to do this is to, to do find on the page. Um, and you might look, you know, um, I, I might look for divide or split or find or something like that, you know, keywords that I'm going to look for in, in string methods that might be helpful. Okay. This is incorrect, sorry, I'll fix that on the slides later. Format this phone number. So as I did previously, I'm gonna uh, allow you to pause here and give this a try. This is hard. Um, this is gonna force you to, 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 to poke around a little bit more and, and deal uh, with things uh, a little bit more complicated, but give it a try. So, so take a few minutes here and uh, give this problem a go. Okay, so I'm going to quickly uh, do, do this problem, and this is something that we will uh, potentially return to on Friday uh, when we meet together again. So the, the first thing I have to do is, is go back to my documentation, um, and what, I'm, what it turns out I'm going to look, uh, what I'm going to use here is this function called split. And there's a, there's a, this is something else that may be confusing, but we'll talk about this soon. There's a couple different forms of this uh, function, but you can see there's, there's a form that takes a string. Um, and that string is re referred to as a regular expression. But in this case, we're going to use a very simple form of that. What it, re what it returns, this is a function called split. It takes an argument called regex of type string, and what it returns is an array of strings. And the description says splits the string around matches of the given regular expression. Okay, um, let's not, I, I don't want you to go down the rabbit hole of what a regular expression is right now. But what I want to show you is what happens when I call that function. So I'm going to take, um, I'm going to initialize. So what I get back is an array of strings. Like other Java types, I can have an array of strings. So this is um, something that's going to have several strings in order. And my array of strings, I'm going to create by using this split function. And then let's look at what we get back here. So like other arrays, 
my array of strings is going to have a length function. Um, that did not. Okay, let's see here. So um, maybe I need to use this guy here. Let's try this. Okay, so if I split around three, I'm going to get um, value one. I think this has to do with the fact that I'm using uh, periods in my string. So let me change this problem to do this uh, this way. Um, let's try this actually. Okay, so the okay, so I'm going to do the original problem, and, and, and you're just going to have to trust me that this is the right way to do it. So um, if I use a literal dot here, then I'm not going to get um, the result I want. You'll see that the, the number doesn't split at all. Instead, I have to uh, tell it to look for a literal dot in the string. And this is um, a, a, a bug in this problem that has to do with the way the regular expressions work. But let's just, let's just move forward because this is actually, at this point, this is going to work. All right, so what I'm getting back here is, a, is an array that has length three. Now, if you try to print out this array directly, you're gonna get this scary looking thing. And that's, that's not what we wanna do. But let's look at what's inside of it. So I know it's an array of length three. What's the first part of the array? Okay, it's one, one, one. So this seems promising. What's the second part? It's two, two, two. It also seems promising. What's the third part? Three, 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 three. Okay, cool. So what I've been able to do is I've been able to use this method on the string to divide the string into three parts. And I asked it to divide it every time it saw a dot character. Once I've done this, then I am home free. All I need to do is combine the data that I've retrieved from the string together with that formatting string that um, my new boss wanted to impose. And I'm gonna do that using string concatenation. Okay, so what am I doing here? So I'm starting the string with a parenthesis. Then I have the area code, a closed parenthesis. I have a space. Then I'm gonna print the first um, three digits of the phone number, a dash, and then the second three digits, this, the final four digits of the phone number. And there we go. Check it out. So I can mess around with this, it's going to work, and I could easily uh, encapsulate this in a function. Again, we'll return to this on Friday, and, and we'll give you guys a chance to ask some questions about this. Um, but that's, that's where we're going to end today. Let me talk just briefly at the end of the screencast about um, how to prepare for the CBTF quizzes, because this, uh, the quiz this week is, is a little more challenging, and they're going to get more difficult from this point forward. One thing I want to point out is that the quizzes in this class are primarily to encourage you to do the homework. That is the goal. They have a diagnostic function in the sense that if you go in and take a quiz and really do poorly, what that should tell you is you don't understand that material. And so that's the point where you need to make some time to review, work on the homework, come into office hours, do what you need to do. Because if you do poorly on one quiz, this material is cumulative. So the next week is going to require that knowledge. If you don't catch up at that point, you're going to get further and further behind and, and really end up doing poorly in the class. So a bad quiz score is a wake-up call. It says, you don't understand this stuff. You need to review it. How do you do well on the quiz? That is not that hard. Here's the algorithm. Review the lecture slides. That's the way to prepare for the multiple choice questions. The multiple choice questions are directly drawn from the lecture slides. So spend some time doing that. But primary thing, use the homework 125 practice problems. The problems on every quiz, the programming questions that are worth a large percentage of the points are directly drawn from the previous week's quiz uh, homework problems. And those homework problems are available when you're preparing for the quiz on the homework 125 practice problem set. So once you've done that, go over those homework 125 practice problems again, and again, and again. This is essentially the algorithm or the function that is going to determine your grade on a quiz. The more you work on the homework problems, the more prepared you're going to be. And why is it set up this way? Because again, the function of the quizzes is to get you to do the homework. Now, there may be a week where you spend a lot of time doing the homework, go into the CBTF and make some silly mistakes and don't do that well. In that case, do you know what? You're okay because you did the work. 
when you do the work in this class, when you do the preparation and do the homework problems and do the practice homework problems, that's how you learn. So even if you just have a bad day in the CBT app, that happens. Sometimes you had made a tiny little typo and just couldn't fix it, or you you know you blanked, you know, or you got stressed out because of the time pressure, or you know whatever. Um, and you might not do as well as you thought you were supposed to do. But if you did the work, then it's inside of you at that point, the knowledge, and it'll be there when you need it. So use the quizzes as a forcing function to get yourself to do the homework problems. That's how you're going to succeed. Okay, so. So quick announcements before we wrap up. MP0 is out. It's due next Monday. Please get working on this. It's, you know, um, the, there's easy parts and hard parts. Uh, it's our first MP. There will be another MP that will follow it immediately next Monday. And so this is not the point to get behind. We've extended quiz two in the CBTF, so you should be able to take it through tomorrow. Please sign up and do that. Um, obviously, we're inside today because it's freezing outside. So there are no um, office hours, no labs. Um, if you do are missing lab today, I would strongly suggest that you review the lab handout. Um, you definitely need to do the lab homework problem, but please look at the lab handout as well because there's some important MP0 uh, setup stuff to do. Um, we do have homework out today. Staff are available on the forum. I'll be on the forum all day with questions. A final reminder about our initial student survey. So if you haven't done that yet, it's going to close this Sunday. Um, and it's worth 1% extra credit. It collects some really useful information for us that allows us to understand who you are and make the course better in the future. All right, so I hope you're all staying warm today, uh, staying inside, get some hacking done, work on MP0, do your homework problems. I will look forward to seeing you all on Friday. <laughs>